I'm going to tell you about our framework that we've just developed. Um, so it actually came out uh, last week. So if you are interested, go and check it out. Um, and I should just say there's no cluster states in this. So you might be disappointed. I don't know. Um, cool. So the motivation for me um, for looking at this Gaussian formalism is for modeling parametric nonlinear photon sources. Um, so I think it's agreed that uh, parametric nonlinear photon sources are pretty good. Um, and I'm interested in the kind of heralded single photon regime. Um, but more generally, kind of the Gaussian formalism, as we've just heard, can be applied to a, a whole load of other things. Um, and there's some references. There's loads of references. Around. Cool. Um, so just a brief overview. Uh, I'm going to talk about Gaussian operations um, and the kind of Gaussian states we're interested in. And then the, the new work we've done here is kind of on discrete variable type measurements. So photo detection where you have multiple spatial modes and kind of multiple spectral modes at the same time. Um, and then kind of the, the applications we look at are, again, these parametric sources for heralded single photons. Um, and then we look at kind of modeling physically realistic, I like to think of it, um, kind of Hongo mantle interference visibilities. Right. So we'll get to that. Um, cool. So Gaussian transformations. Um, so the a Gaussian state, you can represent it with its characteristic function or a Wigner function. Um, but the representation we use is a displacement vector and covariance matrix. Sorry. Uh, so the displacement vector D is a 2n size vector, and the covariance matrix is 2n by 2n matrix. Cool. So um, Gaussian states, such as the vacuum, which is kind of, it has a diagonal covariance matrix. Um, thermals, sorry, the vacuum has the identity covariance matrix. Thermal states are diagonal, so they can be greater than identity. Um, and then kind of squeeze states are the other kind of flavor of Gaussian states. And so there's passive transformations, which I just mean linear optics are like phase shifters and beam splitters, time delays, um, because they don't add or subtract photons, and uh, loss and filtering, which I'm calling passive, but I guess they do technically remove photons. Um, and filtering, here we consider spectral filtering. So it's kind of like a, a frequency dependent loss. That's how we think of it. And then the active transformations, so squeezing single mode, squeezing two mode squeezing, um, and displacements. But for the rest of this talk, I'm going to kind of ignore displacements um, because for heralded single photons, you don't want displaced states. You just want one photon. Um, and then the kind of motivation, as I said, parametric sources typically have like some spectral properties. So uh, we kind of started right at the beginning. We wanted to include spatial and spectral degrees of freedom kind of on the same footing. Um, yeah, so this is like a picture of, of the whole formalism. Um, on the left, these italic uh, numbers are spatial mode indices. And the black wires are kind of like, you can think of them as like waveguides on a, in a chip. Um, and then in each of the spatial modes, so this first black line, we have a collection of spectral modes, so different frequencies labeled by omega here. Um, and then we can, so we start with some initial Gaussian state, so it could be the vacuum or some thermal state, or whatever you want. Um, and then we can apply single spatial mode, but many spectral mode operations. Um, so kind of like these could be dispersive or non-dispersive if we kind of want to treat all of the frequency modes as, as equivalent or not. Um, or it could be a single mode squeezer, which has some spectral profile. Um, and then we can do two mode operations as well. So like two mode squeezers or beam splitters. And then at the end of our kind of circuit, we can detect. So there's a bunch of different measurements I'm going to talk about. Um, but basically, the, the measurement types we're interested in are kind of, we pick some subset of spatial modes. So kind of like a Gaussian boson type set, um, experimental setup. So here we're looking at the detectors in spatial modes one and three. 
and we trace over all of the spectral modes in those spatial modes. So we kind of say, what's the probability of, say, detecting a photon in each of these modes? And it can be of any color. That's the kind of measurements we're, we're talking about. Um, and then, so lastly, we work in kind of the creation and annihilation operator, complex spaces, as it's called. Um, and we use this ordering. So we, we have all of the spatial modes where inside each of these A bold operators, there's all of the spectrum modes. So it's this tensor product structure of spatial and spectrum modes. Cool. So um, one thing I like to point out is kind of the, the advantages of kind of simulating these discrete variable type setups with the continuous variable formalism. So Fox space scales exponentially in the number of modes if you're using a density matrix, um, whereas our Gaussian representation the covariance matrix scales linearly in number of modes. So that's a big win. Um, however, the a lot of the discrete variable kind of circuits and experiments you want to do, you, you don't want to just live in the Gaussian regime. Um, so the complexity comes back for us when you want to do some non-Gaussian measurements. So number resolving type measurements, for example. Um, and the detection probabilities so they scale exponentially in the number of like spatial modes you detect or, or whichever mode you're detecting. Um, but they only scale cubically, which is much less um, if you're tracing over, say, spectral modes for our case. So kind of this lets us have a lot of spectral modes to model kind of physically uh, realistic sources with spectral properties. Um, and the complexity is still kind of, it's pretty good. Like cubic is pretty good for these kind of problems. Um, and then what I mean by it's hard to write down analytic expressions, I'll get to that, but if I, if you give me two sources with the kind of joint spectral amplitude to, ca to characterize them, uh, it's difficult to kind of just give me a closed form expression saying, oh, this is the Hong Randall interference visibility. Um, but it's easy in some sense to calculate because you can just plug it in and, and let the computer calculate it. Um, cool. So these are like the the key theory work we did for the paper. Um, and we call these discrete variable type measurements. So there's correlation functions, which are these number operator expectation values. Um, and the, the important thing is, so this is a Hafnian of the covariance matrix, this sigma s. Um, threshold detectors, so it's this power sum, sorry, power set, sum over the power set. <laughs> of the modes. So this is exponential number of determinants of our covariance matrix here again. Um, and then the number resolving detector, which so people write it as a Hafnian normally of kind of some function of the covariance matrix. And here um, for us, it's actually simpler to calculate when we write it in this form. So it's derivatives of the, of the determinant. And this determinant is exactly the same um, as the vacuum projector. So it's kind of like it's derivatives of how the vacuum probability changes with this T parameter, which I can talk about later. Um, yeah, so we kind of generalize these all to work with tracing over spectral modes or kind of grouping spatial modes and set and tracing over them as well in the same kind of way. So the, the interesting part of our paper, I think, um, is kind of the results. So it might be clearer why we've done all of this. Um, so the main, one of the main metrics for characterizing these single photon sources is the harm visibility between two different sources. And for heralded photon sources, we, we look at the heralded harm. So uh, because they're probabilistic sources, um, you basically, you herald the, uh, say, idler arms, so these outer modes, and that tells you that you've had a signal firing both. So we only ever look at fourfold coincidences. Um, whereas a normal home, you just look at the two central modes because you assume you have deterministic sources. So, and then one thing we kind of talked about, which hadn't been made um, like super clearly in one place, I, I think it's fair to say, is there's like three ingredients to kind of this home visibility. So there's like the interference parameter you use, um, which kind of depends more on your platform and what you have available experimentally to you. So here we, we consider two cases. So the first one is like a traditional time delay HOM dip. So you have a fixed 50-50 beam split and you vary a time delay in one of the interfering arms. 
And then the second kind of interference parameter is a, a variable beam splitter, so like a max ender interferometer where you tune a phase. And so the important point is your home dips are obviously different shapes. Uh, so that's kind of point one. And then point two is uh, we talked about the different detector types you can use. So there's threshold detectors, which are these black lines. So they don't distinguish higher photon numbers. They, it's either vacuum or a click. And then there's number resolving detectors. And here we look at just the one photon in each mode probability. So like P11111. Um, so here, this, this arm dip is kind of slightly beyond the low power limit, which is why there's a separation. So the state is generating higher than single photons. Um, and the threshold detector is kind of overcounting, if you want to think of it like that. Um, and then lastly, there's the visibility function, which I'm not going to talk about here, but it's in the paper. I mean, I can, if anyone has a question, feel free to ask, but it's a bit subtle. Um, kind of using your fourfold coincidences, how you combine them to get a visibility, um, which also depends on kind of which experimental setup you did as well. Cool. So uh, here's an example which has a nice picture, and it's very Gaussian. Um, so this is a pure separable source, and its joint spectral amplitude, which is this plot here, um, is the signal uh, frequency and the idler frequency. So that's the two halves of the two mode squeezer. Um, and the thing to note is it's, it's Gaussian and it's separable. So if you do a Schmidt decomposition, there's only one Schmidt mode. So the when we look at the HOM visibility, this should say, um, the green line is one because it's pure and we're interfering the source with itself. So two copies of this exact same source. So they have perfect overlap and they're separable. So in the single photon subspace, this green line, it's the visibility is one for all squeezing power. Um, and this purple line is with threshold detectors and we see it drops off very quickly with squeezing parameter because of this saturating the detectors, it's over counting um, single photons. So your whole interference is is ruined by higher order photon terms. Um, and then the this right hand side, it corresponds to this yellow line and this blue line. Um, the yellow line, or orange, I guess, is our number resolving heralded rate. Um, so this is the one photon subspace. So it's maximized around 0.9. Um, and then higher order photon terms kind of take over as the, the most frequent. And then this dashed blue line is for threshold detectors, and you see it it tends to one because we're not discriminating photon numbers. So for number resolving, it's very clear you should just squeeze at the, the highest rate you can because the visibility is always one. For threshold detectors, you kind of have to be in this lower regime. Um, OK, so then we looked at a kind of uh, a slightly more realistic source. So this kind of non-separable, uh, like an inline waveguide source has this kind of form. It's just a Gaussian and a sink. Um, and now the number resolving case is not one, even in the zero power limit, and it decays with squeezing. So now you kind of have to, it's not so clear where the best squeezing is to, to maximize visibility and rate. So um, these kind of, these aren't new results. These are kind of just benchmarking and checking all of our stuff is correct. So the, the new results are we can now introduce filtering and it's kind of trivial to do um, because we just construct the state and then we multiply like the filter unitary matrix and then calculate the detection probabilities in exactly the same way. Um, so the first column is no filtering. It's just like a reference. Then we have kind of moderate filtering. So this square region inside the white lines is what we allow through and everything else is kind of chucked away. Um, and the visibility goes up. And then we have even tighter filtering. So now we just have basically the central thing, which approximates the pure uh, state we had before, almost Gaussian. Uh, and we get to like 99% visibility. But even, even with this kind of really harsh filtering, it still doesn't remain at one. So the key point is that a non-separable source with filtering is not as good as a, a pure source without filtering, which also isn't super surprising. Um, and then the different colors, so purple is no loss, and then 10% loss, 20% loss, 30% loss. So 
uh, loss affects filtering more, which also I think people do. Um, and then once again, we kind of plotted the heralding efficiency. So this is like the ratio of when you have a herald to when there was actually a heralded vote on there. Um, so you want this to be very close to one, otherwise your heralded source is not heralded anymore. Uh, um, so this is obviously affected by filtering because you're throwing away photons at the wrong color. And then the heralding rate decreases slightly, but you can kind of correct this by just squeezing a bit harder and it kind of shifts the curve. So the, the efficiency and the visibility are kind of the crucial ones here. Um, cool. And then lastly, uh, so we had a look at some of these kind of more exotic type um, JSAs. So we compare these two identical sources in this first column. And it's so this is a pure state, it's separable, um, and it's double peaked. So you could imagine it's kind of from like uh, some ring resonator system where you have kind of one resonance centered on the left and then another resonant peak on the right, and you get this kind of squeezing. Um, and so this is the home dip with time delay. And for number resolving it, once again, it goes to zero because it is separable and we're interfering two copies with itself. So it's, it's got perfect overlap. Um, but now we see this kind of temporal oscillations because of the spectral features in our sources. And then just because we could, we interfered kind of this non-separable but filtered source with one of these double peak sources. Um, and the overlap in this kind of central region is not great because all of the light is focused in the center here and basically none of the light is focused in the center here. Um, so the home dip is not great because the overlap is bad, even though this is pure and this is has good visibility. Um, and you still see the temporal features because of this spectral properties. And then lastly, we introduce a phase flip in uh, one of the peaked uh, regions. So there's a pi phase shift between these two. And we see no interference change at zero time delay because the phase shift cancels out uh, when you interfere it with this source, but you still see the temporal oscillations. So this is kind of neat, um, just kind of, and the uh, the procedure for modeling these is exactly the same all the time. You kind of do your sources, do your time delay, do your beam splits, to calculate statistics, and then kind of change the time delay and calculate statistics again. Cool. So that's my talk. And uh, if you're interested, you should go and see the paper. Um, thanks for listening.